Hello everyone, I'm Il Changi, Senior Research Coordinator at United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, or UNRWIST. Today I'm going to talk about a comparative analysis of social policy in East Asian countries, especially South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Before we go to the specific cases of social policy development in South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines, I want to talk about social policy in general. Social policy is understood differently, but today I'm going to talk about two broad understandings of social policy. The first is social policy as a practice which refers to government-initiated policies. The other is social policy as an academic discourse, such as welfare state debates, transformative social policy debates, which refer to discussions on various subject matters related to human well-being. Social policy as a government-initiated policies can be found in various government activities. I guess you know better than me about these various government activities, which are categorized as social policy or welfare policies, since you are currently working for the government. You must be familiar with how to categorize different policy measures as social policy within the government. In general, within the government, conventional welfare policies with a focus on redistribution and protection are normally understood as po social policy. Health, education, housing, pension, cash transfers, etc. are the usual subject matters of social policy within the government context. Social policy as an academic discourse has much broader concept of social policy and much broader area of discussion on social policy. Academics tend to deal with various issues related to human well-being in various dimensions, and they include such issues as labor, industry, macroeconomy, and environment, as long as they affect well-being of people. So we can find other issues than conventional welfare program or policy issues in academic debate on social policy. It is important to take this academic perspective of social policy since this perspective is helpful for policymakers who have to design and implement social policies to improve living conditions of people in various dimensions. It is helpful for policymakers since this broad perspective of social policy helps policymakers to pay attention to other sectoral policies, such as labor, industrial, and macroeconomic policies, which significantly affect both welfare programs affecting well-being of people or well-being of people itself. This broad perspective of social policy, which we can find in academic discourse, is important for policymakers since it helps them to avoid trade-offs between sectoral policies and create synergies between different policy sectors. However, it is very challenging to learn from academic discourses in social policy because many schools have different views on social policy. Although debates on discourses involving academics and sometimes policymakers are diverse in terms of other um, questions, issues, and agendas, they can be broadly categorized as debates on four different dimensions of social policy. The first one is the subject matters of social policy. In the context of conventional social policy research and practice, which have had a focus mainly on developed countries, scholars and policymakers tend to focus on protection and redistribution related issues. But as Tandika Makandawira mentioned, social policy is not the monopoly of already developed countries. And in all the histories of development, we can find transformative role of social policy, which is closely related to the key functions of development, such as production, 
reproduction in addition to protection and redistribution. And we can add social cohesion to the list of key functions as Jimmy Adesina has argued for. The second dimension of debates on social policy is about the actors to design and implement social policy. As I talked about in the uh, previous slide, there is understanding of social policy as government-initiated policy. As such, in practice, social policy is government-initiated policy. But government sometimes utilize non-government actors to design and implement social welfare programs too. In fact, many governments' social welfare programs have connections with non-government sector, such as civil society organizations or private sector agencies. The nature, forms, and the impact of the relationship between the government and non-government agencies have been one of the key issues in debates on social policy. The third dimension is about the legal types of social policy, which are closely related to the enforcement, compliance, and coverage of social welfare programs. Social policy is designed and implemented in various types, such as laws, guidance, and campaigns. These different types of social policy have different degrees of enforcement of welfare policies and different degrees of compliance. The last dimension of social policy debate is about the meaning of the social. The meaning of the social is one of the long-standing issues in social science debate, and it is also a big issue for debate on social policy. Whether the social is the one distinguished from the economic, or whether the social means societal is a big question, when we think about the relationship between social policy and economic policy or the relationship between social policy and environmental policy. Whether the social implies political and if it does, to what extent social dynamics should be involved in the social policy analysis is also an issue for debate on social policy. In these debates on social policy, mainstream social policy perspective tends to focus on redistribution and protection. There are so many alternatives to this mainstream social policy, but I would like to highlight one alternative called transformative social policy perspective, which has been developed and used by UNRIST and its research collaborators. Transformative social policy concept and perspective understands social policy in a development context. It highlights that social policy as a collective intervention in economy to improve well-being of people. And it wants to highlight mm -hmm. that Social policy has always played the developmental or transformative roles. And it focuses on all the functions affecting the well-being of people. Therefore, it also concerns about production, redistribution, reproduction, distribution, social cohesion and peace, and environmental protection in addition to protection and redistribution. I'm going to talk about three specific case countries, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines, from the perspective of this transformative social policy, since the developmental processes of South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines can be best understood from this perspective. If you look at the map, you can find where South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines are. This is South Korea, and this is Taiwan, and this is the Philippines. In terms of population, the Philippines is the largest, 
and the, Taiwan is the smallest. And like many other countries in the global south, they all have experienced occupation of foreign countries such as Japanese and the United States uh, military regime or imperial regime. Let's take a look at the snapshots of these countries' social, economic, and political conditions between the 1950s and the 2000s. The figure in this slide shows income inequality measured by the so-called 20 to 20 ratio used by the UNDP and the growth of GDP per capita in three countries. Although there are so many competing theories and findings on the relationship between income inequality and the growth of GDP, at least in these three countries, we can find a strong negative relationship between income inequality and the growth of GDP per capita. It shows that the lower the inequality, like Korea and Taiwan, the higher the GDP per capita growth. Two figures in this slide show income inequality measured by Gini index in South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Sweden from the 1960s to the present. The figure on the left is about inequality of market income, and the figure on the right is about inequality of disposable income. Market income is income before tax in simple terms, while disposable income is income after tax. I included Sweden here and here in these figures for two reasons. Firstly, I wanted to show how high the market income inequality of Sweden, uh, which is one of the best welfare states, is. As you can see in the figure on the left, Sweden's market income, market income inequality was only slightly lower than the Philippines until the late 1990s. Second reason is I wanted to show how tax system and welfare state based on tax could reduce the disposable income inequality. As you can see in the figure on the right, Sweden could reduce the inequality significantly, in particular in the mid-1960s, when it launched serious tax-based welfare programs. Although it is a very small change, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines also could reduce the inequality with tax system according to these figures. This slide shows the share of population in extreme poverty between 1981 and 2019. I could not get any reliable data source about the population in extreme poverty in these three countries before 1981, but I think this graph showing the performance from 1981 shows the trend of poverty reduction in terms of the share of population in extreme poverty in these three countries. As you can see in the figure, the Philippines has significantly reduced the share of population in extreme poverty from the 1990s. But South Korea and Taiwan has had very low share of population in extreme poverty already in the uh, 1980s. Given that the GDP per capita of South Korea and Taiwan in 1960 were far lower than that of the Philippines in 1960, we can assume that there must have been a significant poverty reduction in South Korea and Taiwan. This slide shows the development of welfare programs in South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Y-axis indicates the share of risk-pooling social insurance programs, 
while X axis indicates the share of market-based welfare programs. As you can see in the red circle, yellow circle, I would say, both Taiwan and South Korea have increased the share of risk-pulling social insurance programs between the 1980s and the 2000s, like this. And the Philippines' welfare expansion has been towards slightly uh, more market-based welfare programs, like this. The previous slide showed the way to understand the development of social policy with a focus on private and public sector. There is another way of understanding of social policy in a development context, which is transformative social policy perspective. This transformative social policy understanding includes key policies which have significantly affected well-being of people in three countries with a specific focus on the linkages. The key policies include land reform, industrial policy, education policy, fiscal policy, wage policy, price policy, policy to organize rural areas into various forms of social and solidarity economy organizations, and finally, welfare programs. Let's look at one by one to understand how they have been linked with each other in South Korea and Taiwan, and how they have not been linked with each other in the Philippines. Let's look at the land reform policies first. The land reform in South Korea was driven by exogenous factors, such as the influence of land reform in North Korea on South Korean peasants, and the U.S. policy to prevent the spread of communism in the South. The Korean Peninsula divided into um, North Korean communist regime backed up by the Soviet Russia and South Korean liberal mm -hmm. democracy backed up by the United States after the Second World War. And North Korea established communist command and control economy rapidly. And one of the key measures was to take away land from the rich and, uh, and distribute them to the landless. In South Korea in 1945, when the Japanese surrendered and Korea became liberated from a uh, Japanese colonial regime, land was very much unevenly distributed. About top 2.7% of landlords owned um, two-thirds of all the cultivated lands in 1945. South Korean peasants who were mostly tenants were very much influenced by the land reform in North Korea, and the United States was very much worried about the increasing sympathy and support from the peasants for the North Korean regime in South Korea. Therefore, the United States, which temporarily occupied South Korea, strongly pushed the land reform. In 1945, as soon as the U.S. military government was established, it implemented tenancy reform, which reduced the tenancy rate to a third of the original tenancy rate. Although the U.S. military government also wanted to have drastic land reform, the Korean landlords and its political allies strongly resisted the land reforms. Therefore, the U.S. military government distributed land which had been previously owned by the Japanese and tilled by Korean tenants. It was 11.7% of total cultivated land. The ceiling of the distributed land was 2 hectares, and the price of land was the 300% of average products of that land, which would be paid by the former tenants for 15 years. The newly established Korean government also implemented land reform after a series of political fights between political groups. The government restricted the upper ceiling of land ownership to 3 hectares, redistributed 
330,000 hectares and land rows sold 500,000 hectares directly to their tenants. The lands distributed to the tenants was about 52% of total cultivated land, and the price of the land was 150% of average products of the land, and the tenants would pay them for five years, and the landlords whose lands were expropriated would get the payment for five years. One of the interesting points for this land reform was that it allowed the landlords to have an opportunity to invest the payment for the land into industries through the land loans issued by the government. Another interesting point is about the unintended positive consequence of the government policy failure. It was the rapidly increasing inflation, inflation rate. Rapidly increasing inflation rate reduced the financial burden of the tenants who bought the land in the land reform process. After the defeat in mainland China, the Kuomintang government retreated to the island of Taiwan in 1949, and state building in Taiwan started. The land distribution was very much unequal in Taiwan as well. Over 50% of population in Taiwan was farmers, and about 70% of farmers was tenants. The tenancy rate was also very high, as 50 to 70% of the products. And social unrest because of these high tenancy rates took place frequently. Before Kuomintang government moved to Taiwan, the tenancy reform had been already designed and implemented, and the tenancy rate was reduced to 37.5%. The tenancy reform, which is the redistribution of agricultural products, was followed by a significant rent reform based on land to tiller principle. The compensation for the land was paid for 10 years. Taiwanese government also included the policy tool to allow landlords to invest in industrialization through paying the stocks in government-owned industries. So the landlords received 70% of the purchase price in land bonds to be redeemed in rice or sweet potatoes with interest at 4% per annum and the remaining 30% was paid with stocks in government-owned industries. In 1953, the policy for compulsory sale of land by landlords or land to tiller program was launched, and the land reform process has been almost complete in 1958. The Philippines' land reform process is in contrast with South Korean and Taiwanese cases in many senses. Firstly, the U.S. government, which had a great influence in the Philippines' government policy, did not pursue the land reform. Although some policy experts in the U.S. argued for the necessity for land reform in the Philippines, the U.S. government did not push the land reform strongly. The driving force was the Philippines government, which was very much worried about the communist peasant rebel groups in different parts of the country. Secondly, the government plan for land reform, however, did not include compulsory sale of land laws, lands to the tillers. The distributed land to the tillers through land reform was mainly the government-owned land, and it was very tiny as 2%. This is very much related to the political structure in the Philippines. The power structure of the Philippines was, and still is, based on oligarchy. In the Philippines, political power is owned by a few landlords who own large plantations, and the government 
captured by these landlords could not implement the radical rent reforms. In simple terms, in the Philippines, if you have large plantations, many of your family members are politicians. So there will be mother who is politician and children who are politicians. And this family will have relatives who are politicians. This structure is still found in the current Philippines political structure. About 75% of lawmakers in Congress belong to the so-called political dynasties. All elected senators are millionaires. When rich families that own the large plantation are elected politicians, the government's hands are tied whenever it tries to radical reform for the land lease. For instance, in the 1970s, President Marcos' decree was very much ambitious and radical, on paper at least, because it allowed tenants of landlords having more than seven hectares to purchase the lands they tilled. However, only 4% of the cultivated lands were acquired and the number of beneficiary families was just 6 to 8% of those lands in 1985. This table shows a very good snapshot of the impact of land reform on inequality measured by Lanzini. Between 1945 and uh, 1960, South Korea reduced the land genie from 0.73 to 0.38. And Taiwan could reduce land genie from 0.58 to 0.39. But in the Philippines, you can find no significant difference uh, between the land genies of 1945 and 1960. The successful land distribution to tillers in South Korea and Taiwan and the failure of the Philippines resulted in a big difference in the economic status of agricultural population. The first and second picture show the structure of the agricultural population in both South Korea and Taiwan between 1945 and 1965. The number of poor owners of the land increased drastically in both um, countries and the number of tenants decreased dramatically like this. There was still significant number of tenants owner status, but they had benefited from tenancy reform, which significantly reduced the tenancy rates. In contrast, in the case of the Philippines, there was no uh, significant difference or changes in economic status of agricultural population between 1948 and 1955. 58. The structural changes or no change in the case of Philippines imply many accompanied impacts in economic, social, and political dimensions. Firstly, increased number of landowners is highly associated with increased productivity. Even the reduction of rents can positively affect the productivity. In Taiwan, tenants who became to own the land and benefited from reduced rents, invested more money in agricultural equipment and improved farming methods. Same phenomena uh, happened in South Korea too. As such, in Taiwan, the agricultural products after the land reform and tenancy reform increased by almost 50% in four years in comparison with the product of the pre-land reform and tenancy reform. Secondly, increased productivity and income for agricultural households means better nutrition and health for family members 
and better education for their children. Thirdly, increased economic power and better education mean more political empowerment. All those tenants who became landowners became farmers who could say no to the rich and the wealthy landlords who own a large land in rural areas. Because of this land reform in Korea and Taiwan, a lot of people moved from rural area to urban area. The figure on the left shows significant reduction of the rural population in South Korea from the early 1960s. In particular, many young ones of those households that became the land-owning farmers moved to urban areas for seeking employment or education. Reduction of population in agricultural sector is one of the phenomena of structural transformation in developing countries. The key to the successful transformation is whether industrial sector or service sector has a capacity to absorb the people from rural areas and provide decent jobs to these people. In the case of South Korea and Taiwan, labor-intensive industry, in particular textile and small appliances industry, played a significant role in absorbing mm -hmm. and providing jobs to these people from rural areas. This slide shows that in Korea, agriculture, forestry, and fishery sector has been significantly reduced since 1965, while mining and uh, manufacturing sector, which refers to industrial sector, has been significantly increased since 1965. This is the period when the South Korean government started industrialization based on economic development plans. The intensive industrial policy focusing on labor-intensive industries grew rapidly and the industrial sector could absorb people, in particular young ones from rural areas. Similar phenomena can be observed in the case of Taiwan. This slide also shows a rapid growth of industrial sector in Taiwan after the early 1960s. As in the case of South Korea, Taiwanese government also established industrial plan focusing on labor-intensive industries, and these growing industrial sectors could absorb people from rural areas. This linkage between land reform and industrial policy created important synergies which contributed to full utilization of labor and increased productivity in both rural and urban areas. In contrast, as you can see in this slide, the industrial sector of the Philippines has not made any significant change since the 1960s. In the Philippines, the population in rural and urban areas gradually increased, but there was not much movement from rural areas to urban areas. Both pull factor, which refers to industrialization in the cities, and push factor, which refers to unutilized labor, were absent in the Philippines. People in rural areas could not find the hope for employment in urban areas and did not have a capacity to send their children for education in urban areas. They just stick to the tenancy farming, employing all the family members to increase the outputs with low productivity. Educated and skillful labor is one of the most important factors for development, and education policy is central to social policy in a development context.
Imperial Japan had a significant influence on education system in Taiwan and South Korea, while the U.S. had a significant influence on education system in the Philippines. Both Imperial Japan and the U.S. did better on educational field compared to other European imperialism in Africa. However, the coverage and level of education were still insufficient for development and South Korea and Taiwan made a significant effort to improve education system when they implemented land and agriculture reform and industrialization. This table shows how Korea and Taiwan made an effort to increase the coverage of the education at different levels of education. In the case of both South Korea and Taiwan, in particular, increase of the enrollment rate in upper secondary and tertiary education, private and public sector partnership played a significant role. Firstly, the government established various channels to increase the number of tertiary education to produce teachers for primary and secondary school. Secondly, government encouraged the private sector to establish secondary schools which had some curriculum, same curriculum and teachers with same qualification as those of public secondary school through financial support and administrative regulations. As a result, although public sector has provided education to more than 98% of primary school students and more than 80% of lower secondary school students, upper secondary school education has become predominantly private. Important point is that there is not much difference between the school fees and quality of education between private and public secondary schools except for a few special secondary schools in South Korea. In contrast, the Philippines, even though they had higher level of education than South Korea and Taiwan in the 1950s, like this, they have not made the significant changes or improvement of education systems um, since 1950. The higher rate in tertiary education of the Philippines is the legacy of the U.S. colonialism in the Philippines, which emphasized the use of the Filipinos as the main player of governing the Philippines. In the case of Taiwan and South Korea, Japanese imperialists wanted to use Taiwanese and Koreans as skillful laborers in labor-intensive industry and tertiary education system uh, was not well developed in Taiwan and South Korea compared to the Philippines. Vocational education is also an important policy area which constitutes a synergistic linkage with other policies for development. In the case of Korea, government spending on vocational training was increased even in the middle of oil crisis in the 1970s, as you can see in the graph. Two peaks in the 1970s indicate increase of expenditure on vocational training in South Korea, and this increase of expenditure on vocational training was also taking place in both public sector and private sector. How to spend government resource is a key issue to fiscal policy. In the cases of Korea and Taiwan, which were very much uh, agricultural dominant economies, the government spent a lot of government resource on rural development to reduce the gap between the levels of living conditions of rural and urban areas. When the taxes from industri industrial sector increased, the government spent resource on rural development more than what they collected 
from rural areas. It was, in fact, a transfer of resources from urban areas to rural areas. The resources transferred from urban to rural areas were used to modernize the rural areas and increase the productivity of agricultural sector. The government subsidized the government uh, the, the development of high yield varieties, the fertilizers, mm -hmm. agricultural machines, and equipments. Another policy to reduce the gap between rural and urban areas in terms of living conditions is price policy. In both South Korea and Taiwan, the governments made a significant effort to adjust agricultural price index to the manufacturing price index. It has two positive consequences. Firstly, although the degree of actual impact is still in controversy, it contributed to curbing the inflation. Secondly, it played the role of automatic adjustment mechanism to reduce the gap between rural and urban areas by striking the balance between income levels of uh, rural and urban areas. One of the key policy tools was the government purchase scheme of the agricultural products, which set the price in accordance with uh, the manufacturing price index. So in a way, um, you have kind of a parallel development of uh, manufacturing price index and agricultural price index. In industrial sector, wage policy was one of the key social policies. We have various statistics on wage policies for South Korea and Taiwan, but here is the simplistic figure to show the wage policy of two governments. Up until the uh, mid-1970s, uh, labor share of the total income in South Korea was almost same as Japan's. It was better than uh, Sweden's up until the 1970s. Since the 1980s, when the liberalization of economy began in South Korea, labor share of total income has significantly decreased like this. And since the late 1990s, when more radical liberalization began, the labor share was further decreased. And this reduction of the labor share of the income is a global trend. And South Korea and Taiwan is no exception. But important caveat we have to keep in mind is that the large share of labor income in South Korea up until the 1970s was the result of long hours of work and low payment combined with nearly full employment. So this is uh, this high labor income share in South Korea does not mean that the payment was decent. However, the government tried to reduce the wage gap between employees, which is called wage compression. This figure shows how Korean government could reduce the wage gap between employees in the 1970s and 80s compared with other countries. The South Korean government tried to reduce in particular the wages of small and medium-sized enterprises and the large companies and wage gap between public and private sector from the 1960s to the 1980s. For instance, government announced price policy for important items and wage increase rate of the public sector as a benchmark for private sector every year. And the private sector, where the union bargaining power was very weak up until the 1990s, established wage increase rate using the government announced increase rate as a benchmark. Gender pay gap became policy agenda only recently. 
Although this wage policy does not contribute much to the improvement of workers, it was linked with other sectoral policies, such as trade and fiscal policies, as an important element of social policy system. Social movement is one of the neglected areas of social policy discourse, but social movement sometimes significantly affect the government social policies. In the case of Korea, government initiated new village movement in both rural and urban areas from the early 1970s. It was designed as self-help movement of people with financial and administrative support from the government for those organizing self-help groups. In rural areas, people organize themselves and improve the living conditions with the resource support from the government. The needs of the village uh, were identified by people themselves and they designed and implemented projects. In urban areas, similar process was established. Although the new village movement contributed a lot to improving the living conditions in rural and urban areas, its initiation was top-down by the authoritarian government and the long-term impact of the new village movement is still in controversy. Then we will look at conventional welfare program development in South Korea. Development of social welfare programs in terms of their coverages and qualities takes a long time. This figure shows how selected European countries and Nordic countries developed their own welfare programs. The graph shows the timing of the first social insurance laws in areas such as work accident, um, sickness insurance, and pension, unemployment insurance. Although they all have different development trajectories like this, what they have in common is it took a long time for them to, do, to establish legislations on the welfare programs to cover all the aspects of welfare states. One of the interesting findings is that Nordic welfare states began to establish their welfare programs when they had a fairly low level of socioeconomic development compared to other European countries such as Germany, England, and Netherlands. It can be one of the evidence that developing countries can establish welfare programs even though their socioeconomic development level is low. This slide shows the development of welfare programs in South Korea. The blue lines shows how the compulsory education, public assistance, health insurance, work injury, pension, employment insurance, and old age long-term care have developed in terms of coverage and quality. And green lines is the GDP growth rate in the similar period. It took about 30 years to reach the universal coverage and as you can see in the graph, there are several different programs starting in different time in history. And the welfare programs have different trajectories in terms of speed of progress. Some programs developed very fast in terms of coverage and quality, while others developed relatively in slow speed. I'd like to highlight two programs development. First one is the health insurance. 
Health insurance programs started in the early 1960s when Korean government started the first economic plan for industrialization. So in a way, the government started industrial policy and health policy at the same time. And the other program is the uh, employment insurance program, which significantly increased its coverage during the Asian financial crisis and achieved uh, universal coverage during the financial crisis. The Korean government established and used universal unemployment insurance as a key tool to address financial crisis. When we talk about transformative social policy in a development perspective, we pay attention to social policy affecting various dimensions such as production, reproduction, redistribution, protection, and social cohesion. I think in a development context, it would be very interesting to see the impact of social policy on governance issues, in particular corruption. Social policy, in particular social policy with a strong redistribution element, such as policies for land reforms, universal welfare programs, transfer of resources from the rich areas to the poor areas, and wage compression, have a significant impact to reduce inequality. Reducing inequality is often the most important policy action to reduce corruption. It is because high inequality creates powerful economic elites and large poor population. And these powerful political and economic elites can capture political resources through bribery and illegal and legal campaign contributions and create clientelism through vote buying and patronage in bureaucracy. Large poor uh, population in extreme poverty tend to sell their votes to the powerful political economic elites for immediate rewards, even though they are very small. The comparison of South Korea and Taiwan with the Philippines shows an interesting contrast. As we have seen, various social policies addressing production, redistribution, and protection in South Korea and Taiwan ranging from land reform to pension, have significantly reduced the inequality in South Korea and Taiwan. In contrast, the Philippines could not reduce the uh, inequality and maintain high level of inequality compared to South Korea and Taiwan. Several index indicating the level of corruption in three countries show the correlation between the level of equality and level of corruption. The Philippines has a high level of inequality and high level of um, corruption. And South Korea and Taiwan show both lower levels of inequality and uh, lower level of corruption. than those of the Philippines. In these two uh, graphs, uh, the high score means lower um, uh, corruption. Given three countries began their democratization process in the 1980s, they have similar conditions in the 1960s, 70s, but significant difference in terms of social and economic conditions and the difference in social policies to reduce inequality have been reflected in the significant difference of corruption levels in these countries. My presentation so far has focused on the good side of South Korea and Taiwan experiences.
Learning from these experiences needs some cautions. It is because of several conditions developing countries have. Firstly, the nature and attributes of the developing countries' social, economic, political, and cultural conditions are diverse. They are not the same as those of South Korea and Taiwan of the 1960s and 1970s when they started developing social policies and economic policies. And secondly, developing countries today have knowledge and lessons which were not available to South Korea and Taiwan of the 1960s and the 1970s. In a way, developing countries today are in a better position to design social and economic policies since they can avoid mistakes South Korea and Taiwan made in the 1960s and the 1970s. Developing countries today can also skip the long process of development with a better design policy. In this sense, I would like to suggest you focusing on the following four big lessons. Firstly, it is possible to have policies to reduce inequality and achieve high economic growth. The relationship between inequality and growth is still a very much controversial issue in scholarly debate. But in the longer term, from the experiences of South Korea and Taiwan, with well-designed policies, developing countries can reduce inequality and achieve high economic growth, which consequently improve the level of governance. Secondly, transformative social policy perspective, which concerns various aspects of development, such as production, reproduction, redistribution, protection, and social cohesion, can significantly help policy uh, makers to develop policy packages uh, in which all the policies are interlinked to create synergies. Thirdly, as I mentioned, it is quite important to avoid mistakes of the already developed countries. In the case of South Korea and Taiwan, the lack of democracy was one of the major problems in their development process. All the policies were top-down, and people's freedom was often suppressed. And there were not many channels through which people could participate in the policy design. I think it is possible to avoid this mistake, and we should be innovative and creative to make good policies in a democratic manner. East Asian development is often described as developmental states or authoritarian developmental states. I think in the 21st century, it is possible to have inclusive and democratic development states. Lastly, the concern about environment should be incorporated in policy design and implementation. We live in the climate change crisis. It is fundamental crisis at the global level, and all the development policies should take into account ecological concern in their development plans. And social policy should take into account this ecological concern as well. The concepts and discourses on eco-social policies or eco-social contract can guide us to find more innovative solutions to ecological as well as social problems from the perspective of transformative social policy. This slide introduced key references which I used to prepare this presentation. If you are interested, interested in more detailed explanation on various issues I dealt with during the presentation, I strongly recommend you reading these materials. I better stop here and I'm very much open to your questions and comments. Thank you for your attention.